Hello there and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about how God needs to destroy you first before you realise that he loves you and blessed you. Yeah, I kind of don't really get it either. But apparently this channel is going to explain why God needs to destroy you just so that you realise that He's not destroying you, he's doing it because he loves you. So yeah, welcome to the channel and um, let's see why God wants to destroy you before you can love him. Like any good loving relationship works, right? Anyway, let's get into the video, shall we? By studying Genesis 32, where God had to break Jacob down before he blessed him and built him up, we can see at least four common signs that often mean God is also breaking you down so he can build you back up and bless you. So I want to take this minute just to remind you that for somebody to apparently be blessed and loved by God, even by the Bible standards for Jacob, God had to basically destroy him as a person and rebuild him to love God. Now, I don't have to tell anybody how dysfunctional that would be for any sort of form of relationship that you would have with any other human. I don't even have to go into the points of psychology that would tell you that you're completely and utterly wrong in how you would build a healthy relationship at that point, right? All I have to do at this point is put to you, would you want your dad or mum to completely and utterly destroy you as a person to then rebuild you in their image so you love them? The same for any politician. The same for any point of authority. Can you imagine a teacher that has to come into a classroom for you to show them respect and follow their way of teaching to completely and utterly destroy you, to break you as a person before you can learn from them and understand them and for mutual respect to be given between them. But even in this case, it's not a case that you actually get mutual respect. You get broken down, you get told how to live, how to do everything in every aspect of life and yet all you get told is God loves you without any force or feeling behind that just this is the reason why God is breaking you down so that he can show you he loves you I really want to emphasize this point that if you were to put that into any relationship today Knowing what we all know today about how that would be completely and utterly dysfunctional and completely destroys you as a person, your individuality, your free will, apparently. Apparently that's not a good thing in today's society, but in God's mind, this is a good thing. I'm going to destroy you, your free will, and yet somehow this is good. Anyway, I think I have a possibly explained my point of view so much that there may not be a reason for me to carry on on this video. But I'm a narcissist, so let's carry on. Number one, if God is making you face your fears from the past that are still affecting your present, this is a sign he is actually breaking you so he can remake you. Leading up to Genesis 32, Jacob had lived a complicated life that was full of deceiving others and being deceived. According to Genesis 25 verse 26, even at his birth, he was struggling to gain the upper hand over his twin brother Esau, which is why they named him Jacob, a name that means he takes by the heel or he cheats. 
when these babies became men, according to Genesis 25, 29 through 34, Esau was starving and exhausted. So Jacob used his brother's moment of weakness against him and tempted Esau to sell his birthright for a cup of stew. Next, Jacob stole Esau's blessing by tricking their father Isaac. When Esau came to Isaac to be blessed, Genesis 27 verses 35 through 36 states, But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Jacob then fled for his life because Esau wanted to kill him. By the time we get back to Genesis 32, many years have passed, but God had now called Jacob to return home so that he could be blessed. But before God would fully bless him, he first made him face his past. Genesis 32, 9-12 states, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Likewise, there come moments in life where God begins to highlight parts of our past that were displeasing to Him. God wants to bless us, but before He will, He makes us face those parts of our lives where we strayed from Him. He keeps bringing them up, forcing us to face our fears just like He did for Jacob. So if God is forcing you to face your fears, this is a sign He is actually trying to break you down so He can then build you back up and bless you. So in this aspect of being broken down or being destroyed to be built back up to be blessed, it's a case of God is making you not necessarily face your fears, but actually making you face the wrongs that you have done in your past. Like maybe nicking a piece of bread or, you know, telling a lie to one of your family members or doing something bad in general. That seems to be the message here, that when God makes you apologize for doing something that you've done or to face facts and face your fears or take responsibility for your said actions, then apparently that's God breaking you down to build you back up again so that you can be blessed. Why can't it just be that your moral duty in general, or even from a subjective moralist point of view, an actual apathy towards your own family, friends, or society in general could be that you, um, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe actually take responsibility for your actions and realize that you've done wrong in that aspect, or at least in that social structure, to be able to say, you know, I did wrong and I need to take responsibility. I know this is a bit rambly, and normally I would take my time to actually word this properly. But to me, all this seems to do is state that when you have a problem, a moralistic problem or an ethical problem, every time that you have to face that ethical or moral dilemma, God is doing this to break you, to make you, so to speak. Where in my line of thinking and in my idea, it's just your moral duty without a God to be morally just and empathetic towards other people. Otherwise, you're saying that without a God, humanity in itself, or humanistically, is always going to be apathetic towards other humans and humanity in general. And I think that's really a dystopian way of looking at humanity. But that's just my input. I would like to hear what your input is down below. Let me know if you think this is going a little bit too simplistic for the idea here. Or do you think it's spot on that 
God seems to be saying that any moralistic judgment that's put forward that you have to take responsibility for is him apparently breaking you to make you so that he can bless you in the end. Number two, if God is stripping away all the people, places, and things that you have found comfort in, this is actually a sign God is breaking you so he can remake you. There are times in life where God will take away everything you find comfort in to help you regain your first love. You see, though we often forget this, your life has always been about you and God. And this is what I find absolutely repugnant in Christianity, unfortunately. And that tends to be the fact of your life on earth actually has no meaning whatsoever and anything that you do on this planet and in your life is a sole reflection of you and your relationship to God. And how you have to praise God to be able to get into this afterlife that you can only believe exists and have no proof of existing. But yet everything in your relationship has to be about pleasing God one way. There is no two way in that relationship there is no sort of sense of gratification or actual acknowledgement that comes from God to you apart from what you may believe has happened and I don't mean to diminish your relationship that you think you have with God it's to purely point out the fact that this is only something that you think is happening now, again, this isn't to attack the religious, it isn't to attack God, this isn't to attack the faith. It's more to point out to you that when you have a belief system that is more about something that happens that you don't know is true in the next life, how can you take it for how you're supposed to live in this life as gospel truth? Now, again, I am pointing out to you that the gentleman that is doing this video has pointed out that look if everything that is around you crumbles and falls and dies and leaves you well, that doesn't matter because even if your mom die your dad your dog your goldfish all die and leave you and you've lost your job and everything else like that doesn't matter you've still got god now don't get me wrong there's going to be people that find comfort in that and i get it but if you're under that aspect of god is the one that is all-knowing and all-powerful, then why would God take away the whole of your family, the whole of your life, just so that you can focus again back on Him? Doesn't that in itself seem like a selfish version of God? As in, you can't have all of these good things because you don't love me. Could you imagine putting that on a partner, or putting that on to your children, or vice versa on to your mum and dad, or anybody that you hold dear in your life? Can you imagine holding them to that standard? You can't have that car, that job, that life, because you don't love me enough. Now I'm going to take it away, and you're not allowed it, until you show me you love me. Other distractions creep in. Other lovers try to take our attention. Like Jacob who ran to a new land, who became rich, and who tried to make himself happy by taking multiple wives, we all run from God in our own ways too. But in the end, your life has always been about you and God and will always be about you and God. Before God can bless you and remake you into the person he wants you to be, he first has to take away everything that has gotten in the way of you and him. In Genesis 32, 22 through 24, Jacob is making his last preparations before finally facing his brother. It states, The same night Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. God, in the form of a man, wrestled with Jacob. But before he did, notice that he waited until Jacob was alone. He took away everything else that he had. No relationships, no children, no earthly riches. There was nothing left for him to find comfort in. It was finally just him and God. In Genesis 32, 24, it's as though God wants us to see this detail in the story. So he sets it apart with one clear, simple sentence. 
and Jacob was left alone. God will take away everything you hold dear, and then he will wrestle you down to the ground, so he can then raise you back up and bless you when you are ready to fully rely on him and nothing. I want to point out that I haven't actually watched this video, and yet everything that I said in the last break to this video was put forward as truth and gospel, as in the fact of God needs to take everything away from you so that you can love him again. I'm not going to reiterate the whole point over and over again to drum it in like a gospel, but I do want you to take the time to actually listen to, to those words, that for you to take notice and for you to love God, God like a child, a petulant child, will forcibly take away your loved ones, will forcibly take away your wife, your husband, your kids if necessary, take away your job, your livelihood, everything you need to survive away just so that you can show him love in this life. Now all I'm going to do is ask you one simple question, and it is a simple question. If you wanted your children to love you, if you wanted your wife or husband or partner to love you, would that work, you doing that to them? Would you get a honest to true love out of them? Because I can answer part of that for you. You wouldn't get an honest or true love out of them. They would be a dependent love. You would need him. You would need you. They would need you. So, in turn, is that the way that God has to win your love and your trust? By making you depend on him? Where's the free will in that? Else. Number three, if God is taking away your strength, this is a sign he is actually breaking you to remake you. Sometimes we are too strong to be blessed. The world tells us that to get ahead, we need to try harder, be tougher, and never stop trying no matter how many times we fail. But sometimes it's not life knocking you down. Sometimes it's God himself. The world says, keep getting back up. But sometimes God is saying, stay down so I can bless you. Unlike the world's advice, the Bible actually tells us that to be blessed, we first need to become weak. It tells us that if we want to gain our lives, we first need to lose our lives for Christ. It says that if you want the ultimate treasure, you need to start seeing every other treasure as trash. When God started to wrestle with Jacob, Jacob started to wrestle back. Genesis 32, 25 then says, When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Before God will bless you, he will remove your ability to wrestle with him. He will strip away all of your power. He will break you down so he can build you back up. Once God finally blessed him, Genesis 32, 31 then states, The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. In Tony Evans' sermon on Genesis 32, he said, If Jacob walked on stage right now, he would be limping. And if we asked him, Why are you limping? He would respond, Because I have been blessed. For the rest of Jacob's life, he now had a limp. But this limp was a constant reminder of God's blessing that only came when he was first wounded and weakened enough to receive it. Even when blessing others, Jacob's weakness was there reminding everyone about the process of pain God first put Jacob through before blessing him. Hebrews 11.21 states, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. He had to lean on his staff his whole life because God had wounded him. But his wound was actually a weakening that led to his strengthening. God put Jacob through pain, but it was to prepare him for the coming pleasures. When we see a problem in our lives, we see it as a barrier to our blessing. But when God sees our pain, he sees it as a bridge to our blessing. So remember, if you remain faithful, the Bible teaches us that your barrier is often a bridge leading to greater blessings. As James 1.12 12 Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So if we go by the parable of the story, God 
will take away and de-strengthen you by giving you disabilities. So if you've ever lost a limb, if you've ever become disabled, or had things take you away or knock you down in life, apparently that's God's way of saying you're 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 doing too well. You need to stop. You do you're doing too well in life. I don't want you to do too well. Because if you do too well, going back on what we said before, before you need to be broken, apparently, to be remade, you can't be doing too well because that takes you away from my love. And I don't want you to move away too far from my love. So I'm going to break your leg so you can't run away. Or in the actual parable, I'm going to dislocate your hip for the rest of your life. So whenever you walk, you can think and remember of me. Because that's what love is. Isn't it? That's exactly what love is. Love is, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to take away your life as a point of you're doing too well. I'm going to put you down because you're out of place. I'm going to make sure that you have a disability. I'm going to have to make sure that I weaken you so you need me. I'm going to take away your friends, your family, your life, your livelihood. Hell, I'm even going to make you disabled. Just so you love me. I really want you guys to actually, if you are a Christian and watching this and believe in this type of stuff, because not all Christians will do it, and I'll admit that, this isn't a case of all Christians believe in this, and I agree that they don't. But if you do, and you believe that God is all merciful and all loving, some don't, and some justify every evil in the world for a particular reason of making sure that God is a just God and he's doing it for a reason. When the only reason in this place, and has been reason so far, by the actual video itself, is a purely self-motivated reasoning. You're doing too well in life, so I'm going to take away what makes you good in life. I'm going to take away your livelihood, your life, your wife, your husband, your children. I'm going to take all that away, and if that doesn't work... I'm going to make you disabled and hurt you physically as well. Now we know today that, that would be classified as actual abuse. Physically and mental abuse. Is that the relationship that you actually believe that you have with this deity? That your God, the one that you believe in? That everything that is done is done for a reason? That if you're doing too well in life, he's there to strip it back from you so you can focus on him? And if that doesn't work, he's then going to physically hurt you. So all you have is him as a dependency. That type of relationship to me, I know is describing from this video. And this may not be everybody's personal relationship. But if you have anything remotely close to that level of relationship, it is just a pure abusive relationship. How can the all merciful God that most people tell me exists even condone anything like this? And how can people that follow an all-merciful God that people tell me exists even try to justify and leave it or lead it into this way? I just don't get it. At this point in time, this video that is supposed to, believe it or not, be a justification of God. But yet, all it's doing is justifying an abusive relationship And number four, if God is showing you how to fight your old identity and embrace your new identity, this is a sign God is breaking you to remake you. The principles we just talked about in point three can be easily misapplied. 
When we hear that we must die to gain life and that we must become weak so God can make us strong, we often then apply this to our lives by saying, I don't need to do anything but wait on God. If I do anything, it's a lack of faith. This is not a biblical application of these truths. While God does break us down, when he raises us up again, he then calls us to use that new strength he has given us to fight for his kingdom. We are active soldiers in God's kingdom, but one of the first enemies we must destroy is our own false identities. Notice what happens next. Right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I think that I am uh, done with this video. It comes to a point now where you're literally saying and everything that you said is not an abusive relationship. It's not a case of it being you need to wait for God to this to destroy your life, to rebuild you, but now what he needs to do is completely and utterly destroy you as an individual, as a person, to be a soldier of God, to fight for God's king kingdom. Yeah, I slipped up on there because it's just so amazing to me that you have a God that is supposed to be all merciful and is completely and utterly abundant on the idea of free will, right? You are supposed to be able to do anything and in which way that you want because that's what God gave to you, right? Supposedly. Now it comes to the point of, well, what happens is that God is actually there to break you so you follow him. So, in conclusion, God is there to take away all of your happiness, if you have too much happiness, God is there to make sure that if you are able to stand back up and start again after having that happiness and life stripped away from you, there's probably a good chance that you're going to become disabled or have some sort of form of pain in your life that may or may not be physical in nature to then take that away from you so that anything that's good in your life is taken away so you will follow him and love him. Please, ladies and gentlemen, I really do beg you, and I'm not trying to say turn away from the faith. I'm not. You can still believe in God and your version of God. By all means do. This isn't to say, well, if you think this, then you can't think that. It's a plea. If you think God is there to destroy you and destroy your life or to justify why life is going bad for you and saying it's God's will and now I need to focus my life towards God. Put this into a more person-to-person -person understanding. Would you give that advice to a woman that's being battered and beaten and told what they can and cannot do by their husband or vice versa? Because if you wouldn't, and then why are you taking it from God? Why are you accepting that from your version of God? And why are you then people like this in this video tell you that that justification is okay? If God was real or is real and is to you, why would God want you to suffer this way to love him? Especially with the idea of free will. Why would God want you to suffer to turn back to love him? It's almost like you didn't need God in the first place. So if he is alive and he is real, he needs to destroy what you've had and what you've got to make you realise that you need him. And that's the sign of an abusive relationship, if it's put into this context. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bid you farewell. I would like to bid you adieu. And if anybody that has any questions about this video or has any questions about, well, anything about the relationships that they have with God or anything else of that, or just want to talk in general, all of my links are down below. If you want to keep it confidential, tell me, email me and do it that way. I do not do these types of videos to persecute Christians. I do not do these videos to try and go out of my way to hurt Christians or any of the religious out there. It's to point out the misconceptions of humanity's idea of religiosity. How the idea that a God, if does exist, would want to hurt you to make you love him. Why would an all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent, omniscient God 
need to do that. Again, ladies and gentlemen, please get in touch with me if you want to have a chat, have a talk. Everything's confidential. That being said, I am going to love you and leave you. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe and all of that absolute crap. Speak to you all again real soon. Bye-bye for now.